Good morning, class. So this is what a 62-year-old gentleman looks, after, looks like after a week of sitting in a hospital chair. Don't try this at home. The results are not pretty. Um, last time, uh, in the last lecture, we were discussing the uh, destroyers for bases deal of 1940. And as I told you at that time, it was especially uh, um, controversial because FDR did it without going through Congress, he did it as an executive agreement, uh, and it was really very brave of FDR because he was in the middle of the election of 1940. And this allowed, this gave his opponents even more ammunition to accuse him of being a dictator, uh, in which they already were calling him Franklin Dictator Roosevelt. Um, now let's look at the election itself. Um, 1940, uh, there was a lot of speculation about whether FDR would run for a third term. Nobody had done it before except for his cousin TR, and TR didn't run for a third consecutive term. So this would be the first time that uh, a candidate from a major party would attempt to win, a, uh, or a president period would attempt to win a third term, a third consecutive term. Um, now, FDR didn't want to appear to be too grabby for power. So he didn't want to openly campaign for the nomination. Instead, he wanted the National Committee, the National Convention, to more or less beg him for the nomination, uh, to accept the nomination. And that's what happened at the convention. Uh, the convention, as was said in the newspapers at the time, quote, drafted FDR, unquote. There was a cartoon during this period of time that showed um, the body of the Sphinx with FDR as the head of it, looking out at the viewer and saying, I ain't saying. Um, so uh, he didn't say until the Democratic Party asked him to accept a third nomination, a third term nomination. Now, uh, what was the justification for doing this? Because there was already world war going on in both Europe and Asia. So the argument was, quote, don't swap horses in the middle of the stream. The world was too dangerous, according to the Democrats' argument, to uh, try to have a president who would be new on the job, learning how to be president, while we had this terrible world war going on. As far as the Republicans are concerned, now most people had assumed that either New York Governor Thomas Dewey, D-E-W-E-Y, would get the nomination, or Senator Robert Taft, the son of the former president, would get the nomination problem with both of those men, neither of them was very good on radio or on the newsreels in the way that FDR was. And since FDR had beaten the Republicans very badly in two straight landslide elections, and his re-election 1936 was an even bigger landslide than 1932, um, some of the leaders of the Republican Party believed they needed to have a candidate who would be at least somewhat like FDR. Well, there was a businessman who had been a Democrat, who had recently switched parties. This businessman had become convinced that the New Deal was too hostile to business, too many regulations, and so he had become a Republican. And despite the fact that this man had only recently become a Republican, the party nominated him for rise in 1940. That man's name was Wendell, W-E-N-D-E-L-L, W-E-N-D-E-L-L, -L, Wilkie, capital W-I-L-L-K-I-E, W-I-L-L-K-I-E. Now, this upset some of the party leaders. Your book has got a quote that's kind of shocking because of the language, but one of the party leaders said to Wilkie after Wilkie um, had gotten the nomination, quote, I don't mind a whore being converted by the church, but I don't want her to lead the choir on her first night. So this was something that the Republicans saw as giving them a chance of winning the election because FDR was so good on radio and on the newsreels and the hope was that Wilkie would be in effect the Republicans' FDR. Well, in the campaign, the New Deal was an issue for the Republicans. They claimed that there was much too much waste and mismanagement and too, government, too much government regulation of business. But really, the New Deal was not that big an issue uh, because it was beginning to be wound down as we geared up for World War II. Rather, the single biggest issue was the issue of the third term uh, because 
from the point of view of the Republicans, FDR was breaking the two-term tradition. Now, one of their campaign posters made the statement, no fourth term either. Why would it say that? Why no fourth term either? What they're saying is, if you elect him for a third term in 1940, then he'll keep running, and he'll be elected to a fourth term, and a fifth term, and a sixth term. Now, as we're going to see a little later on, he would be elected to a fourth term, but he would die just very shortly into that fourth term. But that would be the biggest issue. Now, on foreign policy, FDR and Wilkie pretty much agreed with each other, at least publicly, because they were telling the public what they wanted to hear. What the American public wanted to hear was that we would help Britain and China, the two major allies fighting against the Axis powers, Britain fighting against the Germans, the Chinese fighting against the Japanese, that we would give as much aid to them as we could without directly getting involved in the war. So that's what the American people wanted to hear. Now, FDR knew better. He knew that this was a very dangerous situation and that we very much needed to get involved before Britain fell because at this point in time, Britain was the only nation still fighting against the Germans. So FDR made the infamous statement, your boys are not going to be sent into any foreign wars. Even when he said it, he knew that that was a lie, that if he was elected, that before long, he would be moving us in the direction of getting involved in the war. But he had gotten such negative reaction to his quarantine speech made back in 1937 after the Japanese invaded the rest of China. Remember the isolationists had screamed bloody murder uh, about FDR saying that we should give aid to nations being attacked by aggressors. So FDR realized that politically he was going to have to lie. Now you can judge for yourself the morality of that. So the campaign was really not very strong on foreign policy. They more or less said the same things. Uh, the big issue was the third term. Well, FDR won his third term in 1940. Now, it was by a somewhat smaller margin than the previous two times. It was not as big a landslide. It really wasn't in the range you would qualify, I guess, as a landslide, something like 55% or so. So not as big as either 32 or 36, but still a nice healthy win. So FDR was elected for a third term which began in 1941. Now, by 1941, Great Britain was running out of money under cash and carry. Remember, the U.S. had changed its policy under the Neutrality Acts. The United States was required to, uh, the Neutrality Acts of, 19, uh, of the mid-1930s, the United States was required to embargo all of the nations involved in the war. Well, after World War II broke out in Europe, the Congress had passed a new Neutrality Act, uh, which allowed for cash and carry. And cash and carry meant that both Britain and France were able to buy weapons from the U.S., but they had to pay cash, they couldn't borrow money, and they would have to transport those weapons. Well, Great Britain was rapidly running out of money, and so FDR, in March of 1941, uh, asked Congress to pass a new bill, a bill that would become known as the LEND, L-E-N-D, Lease, L-E-A-S-E, -E, Act of 1941. The idea was that we would lend equipment to the British and to the Chinese, to the Allies. And then at the end of the war, they would return that equipment. That way, there wasn't an issue of war debts because, at least in theory, Britain and France still owed the United States a great deal of money from World War I. And of course, France had now been conquered by Germany. So, the idea was that this would cause a big stir in the United States. People arguing about, well, we already loaned them uh, a large amount of money during World War I. They didn't repay us. Why should we loan them money now? So what FDR did was to compare it to your neighbor having a fire, a house fire. And he said you wouldn't charge them for you. You would negotiate with them uh, for the sale of your garden hose. Uh, you would simply lend it to them because you're a good neighbor and because them fighting their fire is important for, for protecting your house because their fire could spread to your house. And when the fire is over, they would simply return it to you. Now, Senator Taft, if you did your reading, replied that no, it wasn't like uh, loaning a garden hose to your neighbor. It was more like loaning chewing gum. And at the end of the war, the military equipment would be so chewed up, then um, we wouldn't want it back. But nevertheless, this was Lend-Lease. And under it, the U.S. gave roughly 
50, five, zero billion with a B dollars in military equipment to the Allies during World War II. A huge amount of money. The United States became what was called the, quote, arsenal of democracy. Arsenal is A-R-S-E-N-A-L, the arsenal of democracy. Um, now, a majority of that equipment was given to Britain, uh, but there also was equipment given to China uh, and uh, more than something like $10 billion to the Soviet Union after the Soviet Union was invaded by the Nazis later on in 1941. Uh, under the uh, theory that it was important to keep the Soviet Union from collapsing, that would give us a better chance against the Nazis. Uh, again, in warfare, there is a saying that the enemy, my enemy, is my friend. So, under the Lend-Lease Act, uh, the United States, uh, this further stimulated the U.S. economy, and this gave American aid to our allies. What pre frequently people don't realize is, people talk about the courage, of course, of uh, the people who fought on the battlefields. And yes, they showed tremendous courage and um, hundreds of thousands of them gave their lives in defense of our nation. And so they should be honored for their courage. Uh, but on the other hand, frequently forget about the very brave men who transported equipment to our allies because you had men who had to fly planes through the Himalaya mountains to get supplies to our Chinese uh, allies. It was called flying the hump. They had to fly through the um, passes in the Himalaya mountains. They didn't have the ability to fly over them. And the men had to wear oxygen masks, which could freeze up and the men would die. A number of pilots died flying equipment to our Chinese allies through the Himalaya mountains. And then you also have men who are transporting weapons and supplies across the Pacific. And their, their ships were being attacked by Japanese submarines. And men who are carrying equipment across the Atlantic uh, to Britain also being attacked by German submarines. And men who were transporting equipment up to uh, the Soviet Union. It's only port that was left uh, after the Germans took the, eastern, the western part of the Soviet Union. The only port it had left was uh, in the Arctic Ocean, and so they had, it's called the Murmansk Run, because Port of Murmansk was the only remaining uh, Russian port or Soviet port. So those men had to contend, not only with Nazi submarines, but also with terribly, terribly cold conditions, uh, decks that were slick with ice. If a man fell off the ship, he was dead within just a matter of seconds. So that the Romance run was also very dangerous. So we really became the arsenal of democracy under the Lend-Lease Act of 1941. Now, a major development for the United States uh, then was beginning to give equipment to the Allies. This meant we really weren't neutral anymore. I mean, our economy was now in effect on the side of the Allies. Up until then, the Nazis, the, uh, the uh, Germans, had not yet started trying to sink Ameri American cargo ships. Now they began doing that, starting with the Robin Moore, M-O-O-R. The Robin Moore was sunk uh, not long after the passage of the Lend-Lease Act. Now, Later on in 1941, things were continuing to get worse for the Brits. And one of their problems was, even though we had given them those 50 obsolete World War I era destroyers in the Destroyers for Bases deal of 1940, they were still losing too many cargo ships to German submarines. And so, FDR made the fateful decision that we would start helping to convoy those cargo ships. American destroyers would start escorting those ships halfway across the Atlantic. Well, this meant that even before Pearl Harbor, the U.S. Navy was already at war because this brought us into conflict with German submarines and we began shooting each other. Finally, after several incidents uh, in which an American ship destroyer Navy ship was hit by a uh, German submarine but not sunk, but we had a number of men killed. Uh, those are the first American servicemen killed in World War I. At the end of October, October 31st, the very first U.S. destroyer, U.S. naval vessel to be sunk by the Axis powers was sunk. The name of the destroyer uh, was the, um, let's see here, I want to make sure that I get it right. Not the Kearney. The Kearney was the incident in which um, one of our destroyers was, uh, was attacked and was damaged. 
um, no, it was the um, Reuben James, yeah, capital R E U B E N, capital R E U B E N James, J A M E S. The Reuben James was the first U.S. military vessel to be sunk in World War II. Now, this is a month and a half, well, about five weeks before Pearl Harbor, and the U.S. Navy was already at war, in effect. Now, uh, in August of 1941, Churchill, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, capital C-H-U-R-C-H-I-L-L, and FDR met together on a U.S. warship, the deck of your warship, uh, this is known as the Atlantic Conference. And they met together to discuss the aims of the war, uh, sort of laying out a 14 points, as Wilson had. Now, critics of FDR, the isolationists, object to this. I mean, according to them, we're not officially at war, so why are we discussing war objectives? Now, secretly, FDR and Churchill were discussing the need for the U.S. to enter the war. FDR was still hoping that the Germans would do something outrageous that would spark a war. Um, if they didn't, he and Churchill secretly agreed that the U.S. would go into the war by early 1942 because it was still critical, even though the Germans in June of 1941 had invaded the Soviet Union. They had been able to slice so rapidly through the, east, the western part of the Soviet Union that it appeared as though the Soviets might be knocked out of the war maybe within a year or so. So it was felt that the United States needed to get involved in the war before the Soviet Union was knocked out of the war. Now, of course, the Germans got close, but not quite. If you know your history of World War II, you know that they got to the uh, uh, gates of the capital city of the Soviet Union, um, uh, Moscow. Uh, they got to the edge of Stalingrad, uh, they were able to surround Leningrad. So they came very close, but they eventually were stopped. And part of the reason why they were was the American aid in the form of Lend Lease. Now, of course, there also was a great deal of courage by the Soviet uh, soldiers who were defending their country, uh, and many of them were killed. But at this point in time, we didn't know the Soviets were going to manage to hold out. So Churchill and FDR had agreed, yes, it's going to be necessary for the United States to get involved in the war uh, before the uh, Soviet Union is knocked out of the war. So FDR had agreed that if something outrageous that would unite Americans in anger, uh, if nothing like that happened, then by early 1942, we would go ahead and declare war. It just would be a harder sell. Now, what they didn't realize was the outrageous act would come from the Pacific. Now, the Japanese now, who thought they were going to have an easy victory in China, they thought the Chinese would just give up very easily. That's why there are so many atrocities in China. Uh, the Japanese were outraged. The Chinese actually fought back, and they were trying to discourage them from fighting. So that's why they murdered so many hundreds of thousands of Chinese civilians. So the uh, Japanese, by 1941, had been bogged down in that war for four years, and we were putting more and more pressure on them to get out. Finally, by the summer of 1941, we put an oil embargo on Japan. Now, that hurt them greatly. They had been buying oil and other resources from us up to this point in time, but we began to embargo oil, and the Japanese government made a decision. I mean, they discussed it. What are our options? Either we can pull out of China. Well, then how do you explain to your people that you lost that many people and were unsuccessful? The other alternative was to take the nearest source of oil in that area, which was a colony south of the American Philippines. The colony is today Indonesia. Back then, it was the Dutch East Indies. And even though the Netherlands had been taken by the Nazis, their government in exile was still governing that area. What is now Indonesia was back then the Dutch East Indies. So they felt we've got to take that, uh, that land so we can get those oil wells. Now, that's going to bring us conflict with the United States. So we're going to have to fight the United States. So they decided that the best way to fight the United States was to discourage us by devastating our Pacific fleet. And so they ordered Admiral Yamamoto, capital Y-A-M-A-M-O-T-O, -A -A Admiral Yamamoto, they ordered him to begin preparing 
a strike against our Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor, even though Yamamoto argued against it. Uh, he was the only one in this meeting. Now, the Japanese government at this time was dominated by the army. Uh, Yamamoto, of course, was Navy. And Yamamoto actually argued against strike, not because he was a good guy. He wanted his nation to win this war. But he had been to the United States, and he explained to his government, we go to war against the United States, then we lose. Now, we have built up a very large Navy over a period of decades. But the United States economy is so much more powerful than ours that when we actually get into war with them, when they destroy one of our ships, it will take us a while, a long time to replace it. When they lose a ship, they'll replace it with two. That's what he told his government. Well, his government didn't believe it. They believed that we were a spineless giant. They realized we were a giant nation, and we had a giant economy, the world's biggest, but they thought we had a giant without spine. So they ordered Yamamoto to prepare this strike on Pearl Harbor, believing that if, we were, if our Pacific fleet were devastated, that would so discourage us that we would just give up. So Yamamoto did as ordered. His hope was that he could damage our fleet badly enough, he could rack up then about two years' worth of victories, and he hoped that might discourage us from continuing to fight. Now, key to success at Pearl Harbor would be destroying the three aircraft carriers there. Actually, the battleships, and there were quite a few more battleships than there were aircraft carriers, the battleships were not going to be a key weapon in this war. So, as you know, on December the 7th, 1941, that's when the strike occurred. Now, the U.S. military had broken the Japanese code and knew the Japanese were planning to go to war against the United States. Now, they thought the Japanese would either strike the Philippine Islands, which were still an American colony, or possibly strike the British colony of Malaya. Uh, so that's what our intelligence thought. They didn't think the Japanese had the capability of striking across the Pacific Ocean, uh, halfway across it, and destroying the American Navy at Pearl Harbor. So there was some arrogance there. And as a result, the um, uh, security at Pearl was quite lax. There was radar, but it was only being operated a couple hours a day. Um, and actually, as the Japanese formation of planes launched by their aircraft carriers approached Pearl Harbor, they were picked up by a radar, but the young officer who was uh, operating, uh, commanding the station that was um, uh, operating the radar sets, um, he decided that, oh, well, uh, that's probably some B-17 bombers that were due that day at Pearl Harbor from California without even recognizing the fact these planes were coming from the west, not, I'm from, yeah, from the west of Hawaii, not from the east of Hawaii. So the Pearl Harbor strike caught the U.S. by surprise, and the results were devastating. Thousands of American sailors were killed. Um, our battleships were either destroyed uh, entirely like the Arizona, the USS Arizona uh, is still resting on the bottom of Pearl Harbor. Uh, that's where we lost the largest number of men. Uh, she is today a grave uh, for the men who died at Pearl Harbor on, on board her. Uh, and so you can go to uh, Pearl Harbor and see the Arizona even today. Uh, and they still raise the flag because the superstructure is still sticking out of the water. Uh, so the Arizona was destroyed beyond repair. Uh, other other uh, battleships were sunk, but the harbor is fairly shallow and quite a few of them eventually be raised. Hundreds of our planes were destroyed. A number of smaller ships were destroyed. So the devastation was tremendous. However, the three aircraft carriers, and this was vital, the three aircraft carriers happened to have been away on maneuvers and they weren't gotten. So when the planes returned to Yamamoto's fleet, he realized he had not achieved one of his central objectives of destroying our three aircraft carriers in the Pacific. So Pearl Harbor actually was not as successful as many people assume because of those aircraft carriers. As a result, rather than the Japanese ranking up uh, two years' worth of wins against the United States and its allies. Uh, within six months, we would be shoving them back, and a key to that would be those aircraft carriers that were not destroyed at Pearl Harbor. Now, this event unified the country. Um, almost no isolation, except for a very few, no, almost no isolation is still insisted we should stay out of the war. Americans were outraged from their standpoint. The Japanese had deliberately and cowardly murdered thousands of American servicemen without warning. 
Um, and actually, the Japanese government had in mind giving a declaration war to the United States um, immediately before the Pearl Harbor strike. So from their point of view, that would be playing fair. Declare war and immediately then bomb Pearl Harbor, I think within an hour. As it turns out, the timing didn't quite work, and the news that they were breaking off relations and declaring war against us didn't arrive until after Pearl Harbor. Well, this had an electrifying impact on the American people. We were united, with very few exceptions. Americans were extremely angry. Um, the next day, December the 8th, 1941, the United States Congress met in joint session. And President Roosevelt, FDR, standing on those metal uh, braces that we've discussed, gave a speech, which is one of his most famous, in which he said yesterday, December the 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. So he gave this speech, and he asked Congress for declaration of war. That declaration of war was passed by a vote that was one vote short of unanimous. And who was the one member of the United States Congress who voted against um, the Declaration of War in World War II? Well, as I told you, our first woman member of Congress, Jeanette Rankin, R-A-N-K-I-N, had voted against World War I, and she had some company then. There were dozens of members of Congress who voted against that war. A big majority voted for it, but there was a fair amount of opposition. For this war, she was the only no vote. And that was her last term in Congress. So the Ameri American people were almost entirely united. And very rapidly, the last remaining jobs programs of the New Deal, like the CCC, and remember we talked about the WPA and the other jobs programs of the, of the New Deal. Those were very rapidly ended because very quickly the government greatly increased its spending. It already had spent $37 billion uh, on military preparedness and new equipment prior to Pearl Harbor. And now the spending was much greater and jobs were very easy to find. So uh, Pearl Harbor would backfire against the Japanese because of the outrage that the American people had towards it. Uh, there was no longer a discussion over whether we should or should not. Uh, so uh, now, remember, uh, the test tomorrow is over the second half of Chapter 35. I believe it begins on page 784 with uh, Herbert Hoover taking the Earth Oath of Office. So the second half of 35, all of 36, all of 37, make sure you study for the test tomorrow. And good luck. Oh, and by the way, the black eye uh, right over here. Um, I was sleeping in this uh, hospital chair with wooden arms, and I rolled over and hit myself in the eye. So it looks worse than it is. But no, no, I wasn't slugged by a doctor uh, So who was upset about the grade that his kid was getting. Uh, sorry to disappoint you. So good luck on the test tomorrow. Uh, if, if my wife is sent to the rehab hospital, which is possible but looking less likely for tomorrow, uh, then I may be with you on Friday. Otherwise, I'll see you on Monday. And for Monday, read the first 10 pages of Chapter 38. The next unit uh, will just actually, the remaining three units of the year will each be two chapters, not two and a half chapters. So the next unit will be 38 and 39, and then the second test will be uh, 40 and 41, and the final test will be 42 and 43. Oh, yes, and there is an AP test uh, that will be coming out, and I'll be getting you a study outline for that uh, this month, April. Uh, so that you can spend some time studying. So study for the test. This is the last test for the grading period. And I will see you when I can get back. Um, have a pleasant weekend after making a good grade on the test. We will see you then, hopefully, uh, within the